So top contract provisions you don't know you're violating that could land you and Bill Craig in the clink. So we're going to run through uh, the, the most commonly overlooked contract provisions to make you aware of them. Feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, but the very first one is the very first paragraph, offer and acceptance. The item that we need to be aware of is technically if you make any change after the original execution of the contract. And these changes are very, very commonly made. And they would most typically include a lender. I mean, the most mundane example is a lender saying, we need you to circulate the contract to add street to the address. We've all probably seen a lender that's required that or to add drive to the address. Um, so any change, no matter how minor, constitutes offer and acceptance happening at that latest date. So it may be two weeks after you got the initial deal under contract. And if that's the case, then the offer and acceptance deadline needs to be extended to whenever it is you're recirculating the document and make sure you allow an extra business day or two so that you have enough time to make sure that all those signatures and initials are obtained no later than that last round. Otherwise, this is not in most cases going to cause a problem. The issue is someday somebody is going to want to bail and they're going to go back to their attorney and their attorney is going to say, well, technically you don't have a contract because right here on its face it said it had to be executed on or before January 15th and here it is February 12th and there's been a change made after the fact and the offer and acceptance deadline wasn't updated. Any questions? So just always get into that habit. Paragraph 11, this is one that in all of our contract sessions I don't think we have ever talked about. Um, but it's one that, that is not so obscure that, it, that it, you're not going to encounter it. It's something that you will encounter because condominiums are a big enough part of our market. Virtually all of our residential practitioners will deal, deal with it from time to time. I have the, cita the statutory citation for your convenience to the Illinois Condominium Property Act. Um, if you want the actual PowerPoint slides, you'll be able to click right there, go straight to the statute on the Illinois webpage and read the whole thing to your heart's content, which is a really good time. But it requires, the thing that we need to know is it requires a myriad of items to be provi provided to prospective purchasers on demand. So there's a statutory requirement that a whole bunch of things be provided on demand. Here's the quick run through, and these are copied right out of the statute. Number one, declaration bylaws and rules and regulations. Number two, statement of liens, including unpaid assessments. Number three, statement of capital expenditures anticipated by the association within the current or succeeding fiscal two years. So you have to have a crystal ball to see into the future up to two years as well. Number four, a statement of the status and amount of any reserve for replacement fund and any portion of such fund earmarked for any specified project by the board of managers. Number five, a copy of the Statement of Financial Condition of the Unit Owners Association for the last fiscal year for which such statement is available. Number six, a statement of the status of any pending suits or judgments in which the Unit Owners Association is a party. Number seven, a statement setting forth what insurance coverage is provided for all unit owners by the Unit Owners Association. And number eight, a statement that any improvements or alterations made to the unit or the limited common elements assigned thereto by the prior unit owner are in good faith believed to be in compliance with the condominium instruments. How many of you have provided all eight of those items on demand when you've listed condos? So I want to make you aware of this and the reason I copied all eight of the items verbatim right out of the statute is I wanted you to know and you don't have to have them every time you can get all the way to closing on a deal and never look at or provide any of them. If you're a buyer's agent you are remiss in not demanding all of these things because your failure to demand all of these things on behalf of your buyer means that if God forbid they move in because they are uh, buying into an association with a $65 a month condo fee and the month after they move in the condo fees go up to 120 and there's a $2,500 special assessment for a roof guess who they're going to sue about that? Bill Craig and you. So 
If you're on the buyer side, you need to be aware of what that statute entitles the buyer to so that you're asking for those items, so you're doing the due diligence. You're not the one making any representations or claiming to have the crystal ball to see into the future of the finances for the association, but you certainly want to be on record providing every item the buyer is entitled to so there's no way the buyer can claim that there was a lack of due diligence or that you prevented their doing their own due diligence. If you're on the listing side, the best, oh, I'm sorry, there's number nine. I forgot, I thought there were only eight. The identity and mailing address of the principal officer of the Unit Owners Association or of other officer or agent as is specifically designated to receive notices. The other little footnote here is the association can charge the owner for the copies, but only for actual out-of-pocket expenses. So they're not allowed to have a markup on it, but if they have to run to Kinko's and they incur $7 in copy charges, that is legal to pass that along to the unit owner who's requesting them. I'm going to go in order and I'll get back to what I was talking about before I got ahead of my own slides. Condo rights of first refusal. We are finding that fewer associations have the rights of first refusal in place. Do you remember why? Well, that's, that's one reason. It's hard to execute it and be on sound footing without at least exposing yourself to some liability. But what's the more pragmatic reason that was coming up almost all the time? That's, that's another good reason. <laughs> I've never seen one executed. The, re the answer I was looking for was because it was the reason that a lot of these associations didn't qualify for FHA financing. That was one just knocked it right off the table. If it had a right of first refusal, that was an absolute bar to FHA eligibility for a while. I don't know if it still is or not, but it actually caused some of those decks and bylaws to be revised and re-recorded if an association wanted it to be FHA eligible because when the condo financing got so much more difficult in the last few years, FHA would have been the only game in town, but that was disqualified as well, among other popular reasons, was because there was a right of first refusal. So be aware that rights of first refusal remain very common. Remember, the attorneys who are recording declarations of condominium, even on a new development happening today, are not terribly creative. And by that, I mean that they're very often taking the last declaration of condominium for some previous development and using it verbatim. So it's very common even today to still see the rights of first refusal. This is not some archaic thing from decades ago. They usually provide for a 30-day time frame for the association either to exercise the right or to waive it. As Edna alluded to, we never, ever, ever see associations exercise the right. They don't have the money to do it, and even if they did, they're going to expose themselves to a legal thicket if somebody claims that they were discriminated against on the basis of a protected class that the association only exercised the right to keep me out because of the protected class of which I'm a member. So even though you never in real life see those executed, and even though in reality you will often see a responsive association get you the waiver of the right of first refusal, almost always those rights of first refusal will have a 30-day period during which they are allowed to run. Meaning the association could either take up to 30 days to act, or if they don't act, to make sure that the, the owners can still sell. If they don't act, it takes 30 days before it shall be deemed waived automatically, and that's after you've undertaken all of the notice requirements that uh, exist under the declaration and bylaws. So in other words, somewhere in there, there's going to be some provision that if, if there's a right of first refusal, you have to do this and that to be able to start the 30 days, and then if there's no action within 30 days, it shall be deemed automatically waived, and then and only then is the unit clear to proceed to closing. So here are the practical considerations. Don't ever promise a purchaser that a sale, even if it's a cash deal, can close in less than 30 days. Unless you know there's no right of first refusal or if you're in doubt and you haven't checked, never, ever, ever tell somebody that you're certain they can close in less than 30 days. You often can, but it's always possible it could be hung up for a full 30 days. And that's, again, 30 days from the time you initiate the process of triggering that right of first refusal. If listing a condo, use those preceding slides, the ones with the items one through nine, I think I decided it was, as your checklist. Have your listing client early on track those things down. The association officers or volunteers, you don't expect them to turn around a document request within an hour when you have a buyer's agent wanting to write an offer on your condo listing at seven o'clock on a Friday night. So please keep that in mind when you're listing condos, make sure that right off the bat you take those nine items let your seller know, and feel free to copy and paste them right out of the slides. I'll be glad to make them available. But send those to your seller and say, we need these nine items, or as many of them as, as your association has or as are applicable, and then get them and scan them and upload them to Anovia. 
if you're on the selling, if you're on the listing side, that's the best way to cover your bases. Because remember, the statutory right is a buyer can demand and is entitled upon demand to any of them. So you always, if you don't do this in advance, you always run the risk of having a bunch of stuff demanded of you and ending up in a huge scramble and possibly losing an offer if it's a time sensitive buyer and it's taking you a week to track the stuff down that you could have put on the seller's to-do list a week before you listed the condo. Paragraph 15 notices. First of all, those of you who are here are the least likely to be offenders of this, uh, so I recognize that, but it is still a very, very frequent source of confusion, so we are going to cover this. So pop quiz, must you use certified mail? Yes. No, no. This is why we're discussing. Must you request a return receipt? No. Oh, come on, be proud of your answer. Come on. <coughs> I won't ridicule you much if you're wrong. Um, under what circumstances are you reasonably, but never perfectly, safe if you don't use certified mail, which sort of is a cheat to give you the answer to the first one. So we're going to run through these really quickly. Must you use certified mail? No. Certified mail is mentioned explicitly in the notices paragraph because it represents a safe harbor. Think of certified mail as your get out of jail free card. Because it is a safe harbor, you know, the whole point of the notices paragraph, you would think, is to make sure that the other party, the intended recipient, gets the notice, right? But what do we care about? We care about if you're going to get sued and if you're going to go to jail with Bill Craig. And so, and Bubba. Because um, Bill's not going to be your concern, it's going to be Bubba. Um, so, in that case, the issue is not so much did they get the notice, although we do want them to get the notice, but the issue is have I covered my rear end and my client's rear end such that if I was serving a post-inspection notice and there's some high stakes problem that if we don't get resolved, this buyer would want to bolt, if you miss the deadline or if you can't prove that that notice was properly and timely served, then the client, your client, potentially has waived all of his or her home inspection contingency rights. So in some cases, that can be very, very high stakes. So, the answer to that first question, must you use certified mail? No. The notices provision says that notices shall be deemed effective either when actually received or when evidenced by a certified mail receipt. So, the reason that the certified mail is a safe harbor is it doesn't matter if the other party got the notice or not. As long as you have the certified mail receipt, that's the end of the story. Whether they got it or not, you can prove it was timely and properly served if you're holding in your hand a certified mail receipt as long as it was dated no later than the deadline in question for the notice that you were serving. If you don't have that, then you will always run the risk of getting into a debate over whether or not it was actually received. Okay, so examples under the last question, under what circumstances are you reasonably but never perfectly assured of being on safe footing? If you're running a week, if you left yourself three weeks on the inspection contingency and you managed to get an inspection scheduled one week later and you're already making your request when you still have a week and a half left before the first notice deadline and you, you send it via email to the other agent and you CC it to the other attorney and you CC it to your attorney and you have gotten in your possession a substantive response to that notice that's pretty strong evidence that they received it if they've already got a substantive response and you're in receipt of it. Or, alternatively, if you already get the whole thing wrapped up, the, the formal post-inspection agreement form wrapped up fully executed prior to that first deadline. Again, I'm referencing the first deadline. Rod? Okay, right there, the first deadline. Say I received seven of the ten post-inspections requirements that they're going to do and she sends them over via email and the next day is a deadline and she calls the next day because I asked to have a mold specialist and that turned her level to a different, you know, turned her, got her a little excited and she says, you know what, we're just going to take care of everything now. And that's in the story. Well, she didn't email anything back that she was going to cover the full. So let me clarify. So you were on the listing side, right? Oh, you're on the buyer side. So you served a notice and you were a day ahead of the deadline and the listing agent said that they were willing to do all of the requested items. Well, they had this 7-Eleven, we're going over it, and then she calls back the last day and said, we'll just do them all. Okay. But you never got an agreement? Nothing. Yeah, that's a problem. That's, and it's a problem for everybody. I mean, it's a problem either way because at that point, because at that point, if now... 
it, it could be a problem on multiple fronts. It's possible, it really depends on who wants to still claim that there's a contract and who doesn't, because that's when, that's when the problem erupts. If everyone is on the same page and everyone's holding hands and happily proceeding to closing, it doesn't matter if you have a contract or not. You can show up and you can get a closing done with no contract whatsoever. The real issue is if somebody decides they want to bail or somebody just decides they want to renegotiate the terms of it and they're in the better position, uh, and then they can make a legitimate argument that there's no contract, that's, that's where there's real trouble and that's where you could get sued um, and have the liability. So here are the couple of quick points on how that could play out. Scenario number one is your buyers, therefore, have been told, because you were told, they're going to do all the stuff that was asked. You don't have the written confirmation. The seller welches on the agreement and you find out on your way to close and they didn't do it. Well, then the, the seller could say, well, yeah, I meant it at the time, but I've changed my mind and I don't have anything in writing, so you can't hold me to it. And furthermore, if you want to raise a stink, you don't even have a contract technically because once you served your notice, the contract terminated. On your side of things, if you didn't serve the notice via certified mail, they could claim they never got the notice and that you're just out of luck and you have no choice but to close because there's no proof you served the notice effectively if there's no proof that they got it and they would just argue that you're still under contract and you simply waived the inspection. So it, it, it really becomes important both on both sides. Normally the most important, most time sensitive notice situation that all of us will find ourselves in on a regular basis is a post inspection notice on behalf of buyer clients that's being sent out close to a deadline. That's the single most time sensitive. The second would be making sure the second routine one that we would have is making sure that the post inspection agreement itself is fully executed no later than deadline number two. If, dead, if you're running past deadline number two, no problem. Common example would be you were, your inspection happened real close to the first deadline. You served the notice perfectly on time, but close to the deadline. You only had three or four days between deadline number one, deadline number two. And there was something that came up that required more research or a seller said, I'm not going to sign off on this until I get this contractor bid because until I at least have an idea of what I'm committing to, I'm not going to commit. So the seller may take four or five days when there was only a three day window there. At that point, when you're going to get it wrapped up and you must keep on your plate, it has to get wrapped up. You got to tie it all up at some point. If you're running past the second deadline, no problem, but you have to go back to the contract, update the second deadline and also offer an acceptance deadline. Very good. Nice. Jesse. So when you send the uh, notice of deficiencies, I always CC myself on it. Uh -huh. I'm sure it goes through. So right. I text a message to the agent saying, right. I just sent it to you. When they respond back saying, oh, hey, got it. No good. It means nothing at all. That is no protection whatsoever. Because notice, th this is one revision in the new contract. It was always the case, but the attorneys really wanted to make it very clear. Notice by or to or from an agent, agent to agent notice is no notice at all. No notice at all. Now the only provision that you're perfectly okay with there is the courtesy copies, the information copies called for under the contract that need to go to the attorneys and the realtors may be sent without doing certified mail. Those can be faxed or emailed, no problem. But you really need to have the proof. So if you get an acknowledgement from the other agent, that's good. If you're a couple days ahead of your deadline, you know the pro process is progressing. Mark your calendar though, because if you get to the deadline and you don't have a substantive response that has obviously come from that other party where if you had to prove that they actually received it, you've got evidence in your possession, when in doubt, go spend the $4 on the certified mailing. And also when you do that, it still freaks people out. I mean, we're supposed to do it really about all the time. It doesn't get done very often and therefore it freaks people out when they get a certified mailing. Make sure that you let the other agent know that you are sending it via certified mail so that they can let their client know, don't be freaked out, this is just a formality. Okay. Um, Edna. It never hurts to just put one in regular mail because some people won't pick up a certified letter. Well, we're about to discuss that. <laughs> so must you use certified mail? We discussed that. If you are going to use certified mail, the next question becomes, must you request a return receipt? And the answer to that question is you, you don't have to. So no, you, you're not required to request a return receipt, but Edna's point is a good one and it's actually codified in the contract language of this paragraph explicitly, which is if a return receipt is requested, if, then you also trigger the requirement to do what Edna just referenced, which is also send a second copy via first class mail. 
And the practical reason behind that is certified mail with a return receipt requested will never be left at the property if somebody either isn't there to sign for it or willfully refuses to sign for it. Certified mail without a return receipt requested will be delivered regardless and you'll have your receipt and so you've got all the proof you need whether the recipient ever actually physically got it or not. You've got all the proof you need. But if you, rec and, and remember those postal people at the counter, they're very seductive upsell artists because you go in there and they're going to assume, they'll do a presumptive close on you and you won't even feel it. They're going to assume you want a return receipt requested and they'll go ahead and give you the form for it. And it's incumbent upon you to say, no, I am not going to fall prey to your slick upsell efforts. Okay? <laughs> and if you do, then they get a double upsell because you say, well, you know what, now I have to buy another first class stamp and an envelope and make a copy. And they're gonna, then they've got a bunch of ancillary services for 25 cents a piece. Okay, so if you're doing certified mail, no return receipt unless you are also going to do regular first class to therefore ensure one way or another a copy gets left at the address. Got it? The other little oddball thing in here is, what if the seller doesn't put an address? What if you're selling on the buyer's side, what if you're selling a listing that you know to be vacant, it's been vacant since the first time your buyer saw it, and the sellers failed to put an address on the contract? That's exactly right, and the contract requires that you do that. So here again, it's about following the procedure even if you, even if you know full well it's not going to result in actual receipt of the notice by the recipient. But the procedure is, if they didn't put in a seller address, you are required to send it to the subject property that, that is the subject of that transaction. Even if that means you know it's been vacant since the first time you showed it and you are guaranteed to be sending that to a vacant property. Curtis. Just to let everybody know, the Savoy Post Office is open until 6 p.m. And they're at 555, so they're not certified in that, so. And, and God bless Curtis because he, the last time he was in a situation, he, he was 100% on solid footing. He was absolutely correct, but he called just to make sure that he had every step correct because I think you were running on a deadline, right? Yeah. Or you had somebody who was wanting to pull the plug on the whole deal. I mean, it was something that made it high stakes, so you knew you wanted to do it right. Yeah, yeah when our new home came on the market that they wanted, and it's a pretty desirable home, so we wanted to make sure we, we had it. So in that case, time sensitive, they knew they wanted to pull the plug, they have a right under the new contract to pull the plug completely. Whether the seller agrees to, all, to fix all the deficiencies or not, there's an absolute right to pull the plug. And they needed to make sure that they had verifiably done so before they got under contract to buy something else that had already come on the market, they already knew they wanted, and they had to cover all their bases. So Curtis had contacted me that day to make sure that every single step along the way, he was following it to a T so that you didn't have any number of possible ways to have that bite him. Paragraph 17, financing contingency. Inappropriate rate caps. That's a favorite pastime of realtors. So here I have a sample dialogue because it's the question that every normal buyer asks. The buyer will look at the rate and if today's rate is four and a half and you put in five, they look at the, they look at the five and they look at you and they think, you seem so nice. Why are you trying to screw me over all of a sudden? <laughs> I thought we were friends. So the suggested dialogue is, this is not a rate that I want or expect that you are going to get, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. Rather, this is a safety valve. This is a cap that represents the point at which, if rates were to do something totally wild, this would be a totally different deal than contemplated and you'd need an out. Rates bounce around by a quarter percent easily within a week and sometimes by a half a percent. Don't put today's rate as the rate cap when you're writing offers. If you're on the listing side and you're on the receiving end of an offer, make sure you're staying tuned in to what rates are doing and be sure that you look at what the rate cap is because otherwise the consequence if you're on the listing side is somebody puts in a rate cap that is today's rate and they drift up or worse yet, you get a buyer's agent who has no clue what rates are and puts in a rate cap that reflected what rates were last month and the rates are above it the day they write the offer. What that has just done is left a wide open hole for the buyer to just unilaterally on demand terminate the contract. Goes back to you can still go all the way to closing, but if the buyer has second thoughts or gets cold feet for any reason, that's a wide open opportunity for the buyer just on demand, can't get a, can't get a rate that's at or below that cap, I am out. No questions asked. Any questions on that? 
inappropriate application deadline. <clears throat> there are a lot of people who have been known to write offers that just say in the will, will have formally applied on or before pre-approved. Number one, it's grammatically incorrect, which in and of itself should be cause for concern to say that you will have formally applied on or before pre-approved. But secondly, it really does need to be an actual date. And the reasons are listed here. It always needs to be in the future and lenders, because lenders won't consider the application to have been made in its totality, it won't be complete technically, until the executed contract has been made part of that application. With that in mind, you need to not only make sure it's a date in the future, but if you're doing this on a Friday late afternoon or a Friday evening, and like this weekend, uh, Monday's MLK Day, correct? So it's a banking holiday. So if you're writing an offer this, you know, on, uh, late this week, you're going to want to do a deadline that's probably no earlier than Tuesday or Wednesday. Because very commonly your buyer gets, it's number one, leave time to get the fully executed contract. And number two, leave an extra day or two for the buyer and, or for you to get the contract and any other final documents needed to be considered complete. This is the one way that the sellers can unilaterally terminate. So we talked about a minute ago how inappropriate rate cap leaves the contract open to the buyers terminating on demand. This is one of very, very, maybe the only spot where the sellers can just on demand terminate if you haven't formally made application by the deadline. There again, buy, seller gets cold feet or seller thinks there's some other buyer that would have paid more and because you put in either a technically incorrect item there or put in a date that was immediate and your uh, application wasn't technically complete, you leave yourself open to unilateral termination by the seller. Any questions? Matt, does it say that they have to make the application or the application has to be complete? have to have made formal application, but so there again you can get into a debate. So we always want to look at it from the standpoint of under the worst case scenario, what, under what circumstances would a lender claim it wasn't complete? And at a minimum, we know that typically you're, they're going to have to have an executed copy of the contract. So we want to, for the purposes of this discussion, it's all been focused on making sure we can have that. But also it's not uncommon that if a lender has checked credit and you know that they have, that they're gainfully employed, you can feel very, very appropriately confident that they are a slam dunk for financing and yet they, or maybe they got a full-fledged pre-approval with all of the supporting documentation turned in four months ago, but for the application to be complete, they've got to bring in their most recent pay stubs or if it's tax time, they have to bring in their most recent tax return that they just filed last week. So all kind of technical reasons, but they're all relevant the day that a seller gets cold feet or has second thoughts or thinks they could have sold it to somebody else for more money. Then that, those sorts of issues become a problem because the seller can argue they get to terminate unilaterally. Personal property. This is where we're going to shift from reporting to the state penitentiary to reporting to the federal penitentiary. Unless it's a cash deal, in which case do whatever the heck you want, but unless it's a cash deal, only include lender permissible items. Now why can you do whatever the heck you want on a cash deal? No yeah, there's no lender, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The issues here, the real consequences here are that, they are that you end up with a mortgage fraud concern. Well, mortgage fraud isn't a concern if there is no mortgage. Right? There is a side effect though uh, with a cash deal and, and including personal property. Say the personal property is $10,000. When that goes to the recorders of a success office, gets recorded uh, immediately, it's going to affect your tax bill. So Fred's point is a very good one, and it also applies uh, at CCAR when I did the contract orientation, which every new member now gets to listen to me do. Um, and I know now you're all lamenting, well, why didn't I get that experience when I was inducted? But last week, uh, somebody asked a similar question about closing costs. If we've now got an explicit closing cost blank on there, doesn't that just mean every buyer is going to want to ask for closing costs because it's there? And Fred's answer is the exact answer I gave for that. Let them know unless they have to have that to make the deal go. They don't want to do that because the seller doesn't care if they're paying $1,500 of closing costs or not. The seller's looking at the net proceeds. So in, in essence, if you're paying, if you're asking for seller related closing costs and you're jacking the price by $1,500 or $2,000, it's exactly the consideration Fred said. If you don't need that, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, you do not want to inflate the assessed value of your property and therefore your tax liability into perpetuity. Nick. Can you not exclude also on a green sheet a certain amount of personal property? Technically, yes. If you have an attentive attorney and if you remember to let the attorney know that these are items that should be carved out. If you've got a duplex, you have appliances, you have 
seven or eight thousand bucks worth of appliances in there or whatever you could specify out. or potentially the dixie chopper you know that too but again you can only put in the expensive dixie chopper that's and that's my favorite example because that's the most common thing it's not that i don't have a dixie chopper and i don't even really have a dixie chopper fetish but it's the most common thing when you sell something that's on an acre or two or five, suddenly the, the lawn tractor becomes a really big deal. And if it really is over an acre, there's a good chance it's a five or a $10,000 lawn tractor. So then you're getting into big, big money. So um, Nick's point is totally valid, but going back to the mortgage fraud consideration. So how many of us have ever had a lender say, you need to take X off the contract? It's happened to pretty much everybody. And you can raise your hand and it doesn't necessarily imply guilt or fault on your part because you can blame whatever other agent was on the other side of the transaction. So you can all, you can all fess up to that without any personal liability. So when that happens, what's the most common reaction? So let's assume that you are the virtuous listing agent and you are but an innocent victim of a bad buyer's agent having put a bunch of inappropriate personal property on there. So I'm assuming that you're all uh, innocent and as virtuous um, as... Uh, new fallen snow, pure and white is new fallen snow. So what happens then if the lender says this has to go off the contract? What does the buyer then want to do, or the buyer's agent? What are they suggesting? Put it on a bill of sale. Yes, put it on a bill of sale. And what do they want the consideration on the bill of sale to say? $1. For $1 or for $10 and other good and valuable consideration, blah, 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 Dixie Chopper. So what are the problems with that? There's two big ones, two really big ones. Yeah, that's the fundamental problem. It's worth, whatever it is, if it's worth the trouble of going to a set of, of another set of documents and wasting hundreds of dollars of, of people's time, you're not doing it because it really is worth a dollar or worth 10. So here is the fundamental problem. In the case of the Dixie Chopper or anything that's worth more than just you know, a few bucks, no real value, in the case of the Dixie Chopper, what you're really saying if you do a bill of sale and you've taken it off of the real estate contract is what you're saying is, we're going to give this to you in, consider, in real consideration of what you're paying for the real estate. What you're paying for the real estate shows up on the real estate sales contract. Conveniently, the real estate sales contract with that consideration happens not to show the Dixie Chopper that we've just moved over onto the bill of sale. Why aren't you showing it on the real estate contract? Oh, that's right, because the lender wouldn't ever approve the loan if the Dixie Chopper were shown as, it, as being on the contract for which that purchase price is the consideration. Everyone follow all of that? That's why this becomes a big problem. And I know at least one broker in town that has made standard operating procedure to do this. I mean, I think that, that firm has a form that the firm created, and it has mortgage fraud written all over it, and that is not the broker's intention. Just to be clear, the broker is not aspiring to be committing mortgage fraud. It just happens to be the unintended result of doing this. So problem number one is it's not worth a dollar. Problem number two is you can end up with the buyer acquiring title to the Dixie Chopper without ever having purchased the house. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so... <laughs> So the bill of sale, look at the last point here. Right. So, the, so the, you are not getting into just grab a form out of the forms book, which we don't have here anymore, by the way. We purged that. Um, but don't just grab a form and don't let some other agent from some, some other firm grab a form. Because if you do that, you're still going to have this. And even if you have appropriate consideration, even if you say to the other agent, you know what, we can't, we can't put this bill of sale for this expensive item and say that it's for $10 or for $1. Here's why. We've got, and you can still have a bargain price on it. You know, so the seller may have paid $10,000 for their, for their lawn tractor and you're selling it for five or even $25,000 or even $2,500. It can be a bargain. It can be Craigslist or garage sale pricing. You just can't have it be fraudulently saying it's worth zero because of what you're paying on the real estate contract. But the other thing that really is important is you either have to make arrangements to hold the bill of sale in escrow essentially, to have one of the agents holding it. So I found myself with the advice of counsel on my side because we'd had the other agent whose firm was saying this is how you do it, except that's not how you do it. The attorney on my side was saying, yeah, that's fine. There's no particular value of these items, so I'm not worried about the mortgage fraud consideration angle. 
But what is a problem is if you, if you just go ahead and execute this along with the residential sales contract, they've just given the mirror and the lawn furniture and the little portable garden shed to the buyers, whether the buyers have closed or not. So point three is you either need a contingency or put some sort of a time delay built into it or make arrangements to hold an escrow so nobody else is in receipt of the fully executed bill of sale. And in that case, think about it, it puts the other agent in an awkward position. They never had the document back that said that buyers are getting all this personal property that they seem to be absolutely obsessed with as a condition of the sale. But because I had an attorney involved early and the attorney pointed out, hey, you need to hang on to this because if you give that back, they've just right now acquired title to all of these items, whether they close on the house or not. All right? That's multiple layers of tricky and multiple layers of easy to, to do wrong with absolutely zero intention. Any questions? The confessional is open. <laughs> yeah. Can't you just simply have the, uh, the buyer and seller reach an agreement saying, upon closing, the following personal property shall pass from buyer to seller. I would not do that if there's any value to it. I mean, there's no, there's no legal prohibition against gift, gift giving, but you still have to, it's still, you're still going to need to make it enforceable. If it's a big enough deal that the buyer is saying, I only want to buy the house at this price under these terms, if those things come with it, you're not going to want the parties to rely on a good faith oral representation, given that the last thing we're going to discuss, one of the last things we're going to discuss is no, <laughs> that we're not making any oral representations. So you got to reduce it to writing, and we have an obligation under the uh, NAR Code of Ethics to make sure all agreements are in writing. Well, then you have an agreement to give a gift contingent upon the gift giver receiving tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, so it's still it's still a thicket. Absolutely, feel free. And I have had cases where the attorney has thought out loud in terms of, well, if we got sued, he's already thinking through his defense. Uh, you know, so you're hearing the closing argument uh, spoken over the phone. Well, Your Honor, this was really just a gift because <laughs> if the attorney gives it a blessing, if the attorney for your client gives it his or her blessing, that's fine. Bring an attorney in if you're getting into that, if it becomes a serious part of the deal. And, and, it's, and it really sometimes, the funny thing about this business with residential is it really is emotionally driven. Half the time, somebody will be absolutely obsessed with a certain item or items of personal property that really aren't of any specific market value. But it's just so perfect for that space, the, the house wouldn't be the same without it. And, but whatever it is, it's something that the lender won't let be on the contract. And so that's a classic example of it's totally emotionally driven because the buyer draws some stupid line, well, I'm not buying it if there's not a guarantee that that toilet topper is staying in that bathroom. I mean, we have had things that are that stupid. I personally encountered things that are that stupid. So the reality is if it's something that's a big enough deal that they're saying, no, no, that's a critical part of it, you have the attorney involved, it may also be a good, no pun intended, flush out some of these items that are really that piddly. If it's, are, I know, are, we, are we really going to drag your attorney at a $250 per hour billable rate in to consult specifically on your toilet top or cabinet? All right, fine, whatever. Devon? So I have a buyer looking at a property where the listing says the seller will not be removing any of the furniture. My buyer would like everything in the property and it is completely a house full of furniture. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the con so you're saying the buyer, seller is saying in the listing that the seller plans to leave everything there that's there and the buyer wants it all. That's a match made in heaven. I got a bunch of crap I'm leaving, and the buyer says, I want a bunch of crap! It's perfect! God is smiling upon your transaction, Devon. The problem is the contract says exactly the opposite. There's a problem. Yeah, consult the attorneys, because the problem is the con So, And the attorneys may even say, do you guys trust each other on this? Do you trust that the seller really isn't going to take it all? And do you trust that the buyer isn't going to at the last minute change his or her mind and say, I want it all out and I want it broom clean? Because the contract says that all personal property and refuse that's not specifically, personal property that's not listed as staying, along with any refuse, shall be removed and the property should be left in broom clean condition. If the parties agree and you have a high sense of, of faith in the other party and the other agent, you know, but I would still make sure the attorney knows. Because what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to rely on kind of a wink and a nod 
and then later on have somebody angry and have an attorney, because you know it's going to happen, the other attorney on the other side of the deal that you never told about it, who was really nice until this became an issue, is suddenly going to go into pompous mode, something that people have accused me of knowing a thing or two about. They're going to go into pompous mode and you're going to say, do you really expect me to believe that your client wanted a house full of, well, if it's, 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 if it's the seller saying, did you really want me to believe that the agreement was exactly the opposite of what this contract says? So if the seller decided they're taking all the stuff or decided they could sell it all on Craigslist and make an extra 500 bucks, and then you complain, then their attorney because they weren't ever part of that and they didn't craft the solution. Do you really expect me to believe that what you really intended was exactly the opposite of what you signed? So just make sure you consult with the attorneys. So like the buyer, the, my buyer's attorney should write up something as we present the offer. Or come up with a strike through and, and, a, and a quick revision to the contract or an amendment that makes clear regarding this provision. That's probably the most likely. The attorney will spend 15 minutes looking at the pre-printed personal property provision and then just doing a mild rewrite in a separate amendment that will make clear that it supersedes what's written there. So I mean, it's, it's an easy workaround, and I know it feels dumb to get into stuff that, that really can be very, very small potatoes and to drag the attorneys in, but that's exactly when we need the attorney to be dragged in because the bottom line is what you're needing to accomplish is exactly the opposite of what the contract says. Marianne? So then you would have to take that notation out of the listing so the lender did not see that, and then is that a criminal act on the agent's part? Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, when in doubt, really the, the takeaway today is when in doubt, report to the nearest penal institution. Just walk in Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but no, that's actually, that's a good question. So quick, quick, uh, quick review. The listing is never binding, for one thing. Now, Mary Ann's point is, yeah, but the appraiser goes and pulls the listing. The appraiser's probably going to send the listing to the lender, and it gives the some underwriter who doesn't have a life and has never seen the light of day, an opportunity to say, well, this is why we're not going to let this get approved. I don't know. I wouldn't put that stuff in there. I would put, I would put that the living room furniture or house furnishings, we have a lot of international transfers or moves in our community. So it's very common you'll get somebody who's moving overseas. I mean, I've had it happen within the last few weeks who says virtually everything could stay. So if that happens, I mean, put it, put it in the non-public remarks so it's not part of the listing that the whole universe sees. An appraiser will still see it, but say, these items can stay. Sellers or seller is willing to leave or sell these items. I was just asked that by a seller recently, and I said, well, we, we're not going to market it that way. We can put that they're available for sale, but I said, we can't just bundle them in. So that just kind of is, is, is what it is. But remember, the listing is never binding. <clears throat> you can say whatever the heck you want in the listing, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. Entirety of agreement, paragraph 20. The contract contains, hey, Caitlin, you just logged into Skype. How nice. Yes. <laughs> this contract contains the entire agreement between the parties and no oral representation, warranty, or covenant exists other than those herein set forth. Here is the way that you explain this. If it's not in writing on the pages of these documents, it is not part of the deal. And now I have a couple of common examples of how you could end up inadvertently doing something wrong. The listing agent assured us that the seller was already fixing fill in the blank. But the pre-listing inspection report said that the seller had already fixed fill in the blank. You may have decided on the buyer's side to waive, or your buyer decided, to waive an inspection contingency because a pre-listing inspection had been performed. And on that pre-listing inspection, there were a bunch of notations that this, 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 and this have all been fixed. And on that basis of those representations, the buyer waived any inspection contingency. Totally fine. Actually, totally, totally sensible. But the thing that realtors are often not going to understand and appreciate there is, if the buyer waived that contingency because the buyer was relying upon a representation that is not contained within these pages, see how neatly this comes right back into this verbiage? You're out of luck. Now if it's 5A2 and the buyer notices it wasn't fixed as, as it had been represented in the inspection report, there's still a remedy because 5A2 entitles them to normal working condition. But if it's not a 5A2 item, Let's say it was a window repair, or it was wood rot, or it was a roof repair, or it was a foundation issue, or it was tuck pointing, 
any no chimney, any number of high dollar items that are outside the scope of 5A2 and the buyer relied upon their representation in their pre-listing inspection report, the notation in the margin and it wasn't in the contract, absolutely out of luck. But I have a solution. The best practices are, and this feels weird, and Caitlin can take that out of context and use that for all sorts of things. It will feel very weird when you do the following. <laughs> use a repair amendment even if the seller has already told you they did it. So except for 582 items, you're simply out of luck if you waive the inspection contingency. So here's what feels very strange about that. You're going to have to train the listing agent on the other side, unless it's one of the other fine professionals here in this room today. You will at some point, if you do this, have to train the agent on the other side who's going to say, why do you have a repair amendment in here for all the stuff they already said they did? Because the repair amendment is the only way to create an enforceable obligation that the repairs that they've separately represented that they have made can actually be raised as unsatisfactory with an enforceable obligation to correct it and to deliver those items repaired in normal, in a workmanlike manner. That's the verbiage in the contract. Curtis. So I just had a deal where I did just that. Um, the, I guess the listing came with um, an inspection report, so we put it all out on the um, repair minute. Anyways, we're going to be closing tomorrow, and one of, one of the repairs was something with the roof, like a flashing or something. And anyways, with all the snow and all that, we haven't been able to get up there to see. Mm -hmm. So after we close, if we find out that that hasn't been done, is there any course of action we can take? Did everyone hear Curtis's question? All right. So the best way to do that, that's a really, really good question because it, it just, it's a reality during the winter when you got a snow cover. So the best way is, of course, if you get to closing, unless you've made very explicit arrangements to the contrary, closing is closing. It absolves the seller of any further obligation or entanglements with respect to the property with very limited exceptions. One of them is if they lied. Uh, if they fraudulently misrepresented something, if they lied on their disclosure report, there's a few ways that the seller can get, um, can get uh, on the hook for something. But in that case where you just can't verify that it's done, but the seller knows that they did have it done, um, it should be no big problem. Again, you have to bring in the attorneys for the attorneys to draft a very, in fact, this is the sort of thing they would literally hand write out on a legal pad at the closing table. Something that just says that that obligation shall survive closing for a period of 30 days or 60 days. You know, if it's January, it'll survive closing for at least 60 days so that if within those 60 days your clients have undertaken a follow-up inspection and they have found that that item wasn't repaired as promised, that there is still a remedy. Okay? Good, good question. It's another reason. Do you all detect a recurring theme? Involve attorneys. Yeah, get it in writing and involve attorneys. Rod. What if they go a step farther and uh, you said workmanlike manner, I know it's in the contract, and they get cold feet. He has a young kid and wants to bring in a specialist on the mold. He just doesn't trust a normal workmanlike manner by a construction man. Can you, <clears throat> before closing, can you go over to the open, uh, to the house and bring a specialist in and pay yourself? Hypothetically. Um, <laughs> Here are the issues with that. If you just list the stuff that needs to be fixed, then it's just the pre-printed language in either the inspection, the post-inspection agreement, or in the repair amendment that just says the following shall be repaired in a workmanlike manner. That's the default language. We have learned that in many, many types of defects, there are multiple ways it can be repaired. To use a real estate technical term, on one end of the spectrum, there's the half-assed way to repair it. And then on the more preferable end, if you're the buyer's agent, there's the correct way to repair it. If you want to make sure that you're not left surprised with which of the methods on that continuum they have chosen, you want to articulate what kind of repair. If there is any doubt as to whether it requires a licensed professional or as to whether the use of a licensed and or certified professional is really of paramount importance, then you need to put that in there. And I don't mean to, for you to go overboard on that. I'm not suggesting that you all put that in there all the time because that's another source of irritation. If you have a sophisticated repair that involves somebody digging into the bowels of your electric service panel, is it good practice to have a licensed electrician do that? Yes. 
If there's a ground wire that came loose from a three-prong receptacle, is it really critically important that we have a licensed electrician that shows up and charges a minimum $100 site visit to do that when it could have gone on the list of a generally competent handyman that was going to do several other items and where a $3 outlet tester would confirm that the repair in question had been completed. So be careful not to assume that what I'm saying is always, always, always over clarify and demand licensed professional because quite honestly I've been on the receiving end of those where I've said to the seller I don't think we should agree to that because I think that's going to unnecessarily inflate your cost in a way that really doesn't contribute to, a, to higher quality repair. So if it's important to the buyer, the buyer really needs to make that level of clarity show up in the repair amendment or post inspection agreement because if it does not, then it becomes subject for debate. But it's still open for debate because then there's this issue of, well, there exists a mold remediation certification. There's not a license law that requires it, but there exists a, an industry standard and this person didn't have it because naturally the person who didn't have it was the cheaper person for the seller to use. So I mean, it, it's another legal thicket where there isn't a clear answer. So whenever possible, we want to make sure that there's a bright line so it is really screamingly obvious. Because if it's anything other than a bright line, it becomes a game of chicken in terms of who wants to sue whom under the default paragraph. And if that's the case, and it's not really, really, really clear who's in the right, then either party could turn up the loser and end up not only losing on the merits and being responsible for damages, but also for the court costs and attorney's fees of both parties. That will not help you retroactively, <laughs> but, but you know, whatever it was, use it as a learning experience to make sure if you're on the receiving end of these things, make sure you're looking for that. If you're on the buyer's side of them and you're writing those things, make sure you're very deliberate in specifying if it's critically important, specifying licensed or certified or naming the contractor in question. In the example of mold, there's exactly one contractor of whom I'm aware who's got a PhD in microbiology and every conceivable certification. There are others who have certifications, but if, the, if that's the one guy you want, go ahead and name the contractor. Be prepared for the seller to say no if that's four times more expensive, but if that is critically important and you want to be able to walk, if that's not what they're going to prepare to do, name it up front, put it in writing. Just to be clear, I'm not referring to any of you fine people when I say clueless listing agent. <clears throat> but as I said earlier, be prepared to train somebody else on this. Any questions on this? No other amendments. You can see I really did, I pulled the, the obscure stuff out of here that people really do love to completely ignore. Read the verbiage that follows paragraph 21 and make your buyers read it too. Here is the verbiage that follows paragraph 21. No other amendment forms or additional provisions inserted in this contract are in common usage in Champaign County, Illinois. What is the significance of saying they're not in common usage? If it's not in, it's not just pre-printed. Pre-printed form in common usage is the scope within which real estate licensees are allowed to fill it in. So if it's not both pre-printed with just blanks and in common usage, Technically, it is no longer legal for you to fill in the blanks on some non-common usage form. So the attorneys who drafted this were pretty clever in saying the only thing that qualifies as being in common usage are our pre-printed MLS amendments. Okay? Anything else is not in common usage and therefore you're treading on thin ice. Parties are urged to seek legal advice before accepting any other amendment forms or additional provisions. This is a seven page contract and it's recommended that all parties initial each page, although failure to do so will not affect the validity of the contract. What was that? That's crazy. Why did they put yeah. it there? Oh my goodness, there was a debate. There was a, <laughs> suffice it to say there was a protracted debate. But ultimately the attorneys felt like, I actually was the one years ago that on the last electronic version of the MLS form added the initial lines because I got real tired when we had NCR triplicate carbon copy two-sided forms. I got really tired of agents faxing pages one and four with no evidence that the other party had ever even seen that there was a page two or a page three. And so I added initial lines and that conversation came up in this latest revision of the contract and the attorneys decided, well, if it's been properly signed, we really shouldn't technically make it a requirement, but it's a good idea. So if it's not technically a requirement, we need to say it's not technically a requirement. So it's clear it's not technically a requirement. There you have it. No other amendments. Here are some things that you need to be aware of. Most common example, well, 
There are a couple of common examples. This is the most common proper example. There are some common bad home brewed form examples. Relo transactions, they will almost always involve a proprietary contract rider. Any such proprietary contract rider will supersede any conflicting MLS contract provisions. Oh, but don't worry, it only supersedes virtually all of them. Almost every substantive part of the MLS contract is in fact superseded by a conflicting provision in the rider. <clears throat> It's kind of like the rider is a body snatcher. You've got this shell of a contract that really has almost no provisions left because the rider itself overrides almost everything. It means that you don't play by the rules that you're used to playing by. We are creatures of habit. You are trained on how it is that we operate within the rules laid out in our seven page MLS contract. All of those rules are off the table when you're dealing with a proprietary relocation company rider or any other institutional seller. REOs, short sales end up sometimes with proprietary riders, any of those things. The rules of the game have just been fundamentally shifted and you need to be aware of it. And you don't need to be aware of it so you can then practice law without a license on that new form. You need to be aware of it so that you can involve an attorney, yes. So a, a common example and a recent example where one of our agents called is, I need to get my buyers out of this deal because they want to terminate the contract. It's a relocation company deal. We just, need to st we just need on the post inspection notice to say we're using the unilateral termination provision, right? No, because it's a relocation company deal with a proprietary relocation company rider within which is a proprietary relocation company inspection contingency, which because of a provision that says it supersedes the contract to which it's attached means that those dates that you filled in and felt really good about, it's very satisfying putting in dates and deadlines in the MLS contract inspection contingency, it doesn't mean anything. And therefore the post inspection form which specifically ties in to the verbiage in our MLS contract inspection contingency is not what you want to use. You need to consult your client's attorney. Okay, so be very, very aware of that because it's, it's another really easy one to not even realize, hey, wait a minute, because you, know, you, you, you see the contract come in and it feels so comforting. It's the MLS contract that we all know and love, but none of that really means anything. So just be aware of it. Um, create special risk that you will give incorrect advice, miss a deadline, or otherwise go to prison. Again, recurring theme of today's session. Well, <laughs> Post-signature warning. Scope of the permissible use of the MLS contract. Remember, this is another easy way to go to prison. Uh, well, really not, you're not likely to do prison time. You're likely to just get sued. Um, previously occupied single family property. That means not multifamily, not new construction, not commercial, not co-ops. Technically, not even a not new but not previously occupied property. Could have been a builder model that's been out there for three years, totally finished, sod, seed, everything. There's nothing left that needs to be done to it. Don't use the residential sales contract for it because it's technically outside the scope. Can you use the residential sales contract and have it be legal and get to closing and have everything be very happy? Yes. Yes, you can. But it goes back to the issue is voidable by either party. So on the one hand, you can, it is fundamentally legal to, you, to misuse it. You can use it outside of its intended scope and you can get all the way to closing and if everyone stays on the same page, it's all good. The problem is if anyone wants out or wants to renegotiate or thinks they have you over a barrel because your bargaining position has since weakened and theirs has not, they just void it on demand. <clears throat> or in a case that we saw not long ago, there were multiple offers and you execute the contract and the parties initially both thought, all right, we've inked a deal, that's the deal, until somebody else shows up after the buzzer with a better offer, thousands of dollars better. And then the seller says on second thought, if there's an out, I think I want to cancel this. Isn't there some right of rescission? Well, as soon as they see their attorney, no, there's not the three-day right of rescission that exists on owner-occupied refinances. There's not an attorney review clause. Oh, but this form was fundamentally misused, so all you have to do is void it on demand meaning that you've just exposed yourself as an agent to big time liability because some other agent's buyer just found out that the contract that they had been told was a binding contract really wasn't, okay? 
So the stakes are very high. Yes, you can screw it up and get all the way to closing and actually get all the way to closing most times and it won't be a problem. If it's a problem, it will be a very big problem. And we've seen it become a problem just recently. Any questions on that? Any questions about anything else we've discussed? Pete? What form would one use then in terms of a co-op? I've never had... In any time you're doing anything that doesn't work for the residential sales contract, you always just want to use a, a memorandum of purchase. And the re there are multiple reasons, but the biggest reason is it doesn't matter what you do on the memorandum, you're not going to be guilty of practicing law without a license. Because, and, it, and the whole point of the form was just that. That's why the first thing it says is this is not a contract for the sale of real estate. Therefore, you can treat it as a creative writing exercise. The whole point, and this would be the talking point for your buyer client. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, this is not a binding contract for the sale of real estate. That means this will not be enforceable. That means that really all we're doing here is we're using a form to, to lay out the skeleton of what we expect the final contract terms to be. We're going to lay out the basic roadmap so that attorneys can get a final contract put together and then we'll execute it. Be aware that until that last step happens, attorneys put it together and it's fully executed, you don't have it under contract. Somebody else could come in and buy it. So be sure you're on record saying that at some point because you know if you don't, there's going to be a second and a third offer and your people aren't going to get it and they're going to say, but the builder had signed this or the other person had signed this. So that's one issue. But the other issue is because it's not a contract, you do whatever the heck you want in writing. Explain whatever whacked out special situation you have in mind and it's totally legal. The attorney may still tell you, here's why we can't actually do it that way, but you're not going to get in trouble where you've jacked up a contract and the attorney says you practice law without a license. So that's a good question. Edna? Um, how would you handle representation of a buyer client who has come from a market that is used to having an attorney review the contract? Make sure they know that there is no attorney review. Right. Make sure they understand not only is that okay, but God bless you for wanting it reviewed by an attorney. That's totally fine. I'll be glad to send your attorney a copy of this before you sign it. But just make sure they know any attorney review has to happen before you make the offer if that's the case because there is no after the fact ability to pull the plug just because your attorney doesn't like something. And then also make sure they know, so if you're in a hurry or if you're worried about a second offer coming in, just be aware that delay can be an issue. And if you think that that's going to be an issue or if you have the opportunity to talk about it earlier, then offer to send it to their attorney um, you know, before you even find the right property. Friday night at 8 o'clock. Right. That's when they always ask. That's when they always have the, the question. Yeah. Yep. When, when the market's hot. Right. You just have to have your buyers trust you. No. Always be on record telling your buyers that they should have an attorney. I mean, oh, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always do. Yeah. In fact, I had to do a little arm-twisting recent one, but... <laughs> um. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, let me tell you about an exciting new feature of our inspection contingency, which is the unilateral termination <laughs> right of the buyer. <laughs> One last item. I have an assignment, but there's a prize. I haven't discussed this with the other partners, but um, I have a prize. I am challenging each of you to find me the most atrocious example of some hideously cluttered intersection, subdivision, subdivision entrance, or right-of-way that has a forest of illegal real estate yard signs. Because this is going to be something we are going to discuss in the future, and I really would like the most atrocious possible visual aid. The winner will get determined no later than our next uh, Legal Thursday session, and we'll do some sort of a $50 prize, probably a $50 gas card. Any other questions, guys? Thanks.